Uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am uh, <coughs> really uh, representing uh, these, uh, these folks. These are the colleagues back at Carnegie Mellon who've done all the heavy lifting uh, on this uh, project. And uh, the work I'll be presenting is uh, due mostly, uh, mostly to them. Um, so very briefly, uh, it looks like all of us are starting talks with uh, why the interest in carbon capture. And the professor and me can't help that, assuming that some of you have come here without too much background in this. I'll talk a little bit about the objectives and scope of our GSEP project, uh, some progress uh, uh, to date, and, uh, and some of the work ahead. <clears throat> so why the interest in carbon capture, uh, in addition to uh, Ed's comments and others, Again, the fundamental motivation is climate change and the fact that we need not small reductions but large reductions in CO2 emissions uh, in order to achieve those goals. If we were talking about 5 or 10 percent reductions to solve the climate problem, we would probably not be talking about CCS. 70, 50, 80 percent is a different story. Fundamentally, CCS is the only technology available <coughs> that we know of uh, that can address carbon emissions from the existing use of fossil fuels, which <clears throat> are likely to be around for, for some time. So my, my view of it is, uh, is more of a, a bridging technology, something that uh, will uh, be necessary if we want to get large carbon reductions uh, fairly quickly while we're working on a long-term uh, sustainable future. Uh, CCS also turns out to be a major component uh, in all the modeling studies that are done uh, globally, when one looks at cost-effective strategies to meet climate change, every modeling group uh, who's looked at this uh, shows that without CCS on the table, the costs of achieving climate goals will be substantially higher than without. Trillions of dollars uh, are typically estimates that, that come out of that. So uh, while the focus of this talk is on CO2 capture, we, we shouldn't forget that it's really part of a capture and storage or sequestration system that has three major components. <clears throat> uh, first, the, uh, the ability to capture CO2 from power plants and other industrial sources that produce it. Uh, again, the CO2 might arise from coal combustion, but it might also arise from natural gas combustion or the use of biomass, <clears throat> so-called negative emissions. Uh, <clears throat> In order to sequester or store it in a geologic formation, which looks like the most likely uh, uh, option right now, uh, one has to compress and transport it. Uh, and so the compression is typically needed to turn it into a, a supercritical fluid, essentially a liquid uh, that can be moved by a pipeline to uh, uh, appropriate storage uh, sites. Um, we're going to be talking about two major approaches. <clears throat> what we can do today, we've talked about and Ed set this up beautifully, post-combustion and, and pre-combustion. Here's a little more detailed schematic of what a post-combustion system would look like at a, uh, a coal-fired power plant today. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is what most of the utilities look like without the CO2 capture piece. Uh, so the yellow box in the middle are a variety of uh, technologies to address so-called uh, criteria or conventional air pollutants, SOx, NOx, particulates, <clears throat> mercury. Um, and if one were to capture CO2 in a post-combustion environment, one would add uh, another piece of technology after that <clears throat> upstream of the stack. And uh, as Ed uh, indicated, the current technology that would, would do that job uh, is an amine-based system. We have CO2 at uh, low concentrations and low pressure. So this is a chemical uh, solvent, <clears throat> and uh, its energy uh, requirements are, uh, are substantial. Uh, the pre-combustion system um, looks a little more complex. The CO2 capture piece here actually has two components. <clears throat> uh, there's a CO2 capture unit uh, toward the back here, which today would use a physical solvent. So here we have high pressures and relatively high concentrations of CO2. So rather than a chemical uh, solvent, one can use a physical sorbent uh, to, uh, to do that job at a much lower energy cost. But in order for that to work, one first needs to add upstream a water gas shift reactor that basically uh, is a, a chemical process that converts CO in, in the gas to CO2 and H2. So uh, the CO2 capture unit is basically trying to work on a, on a, uh, a, hydro, at a CO2 hydrogen mixture as opposed to the post-combustion, which is largely a CO2 nitrogen mixture at much lower pressures. 
Again, the chemical that would be used today <coughs> favorably is commercial called Selexol. It's a glycol-like substance that uh, uh, has been used widely in industrial applications. Um, here's what some of this actually looks like in terms of hardware. These technologies for both post-combustion and pre-combustion have been used um, at power plants, both gas and coal-fired power plants, the two on, on the left, at scales uh, roughly an order of magnitude smaller than a commercial plant today. So these units are in the order of a couple of tens of megawatt uh, electricity uh, equivalent. Uh, hydrogen production uh, plants, or uh, this particular one uses a, uh, a Selexol system to essentially do the same separation, except the hydrogen is, uh, is used to make chemicals instead of, uh, instead of electricity. Uh, here are uh, photos of two newer uh, developments. Uh, the one on the top is, um, that would be fair to say, a big deal. Uh, this is the first uh, large-scale demonstration of post-combustion capture at a coal-fired power plant. It's what the community has been waiting at, uh, at least a decade uh, for. Uh, in uh, this, uh, uh, Canada won, uh, won the lottery on, on this one. The, the Sask Power Boundary Dam facility at 110 megawatts. There was official inauguration on this uh, just two weeks ago. The plant started up a month ago. Uh, the CO2 capture unit is in the, let's see if I can get the, is this, uh, this unit in the foreground. Uh, so this is now operating at 90% uh, capture and uh, for the first month or so, uh, so far, uh, so good. Uh, <clears throat> The picture on the bottom is a unit still under construction uh, that is now scheduled to start next year rather than this year. It's a large uh, gasification plant that uh, the Southern Company is, is building, um, and it will uh, capture uh, CO2 using uh, Selexol uh, as, a, as a solvent uh, at a scale of 600 megawatts with uh, about 65% capture. So we're starting to see in these uh, two examples and others that are planned in, uh, in Europe, uh, the first large-scale uh, uh, implementations of that. Uh, if that's the good news, this is the bad news. They're expensive technologies <coughs> uh, to uh, one significant digit uh, in, in a new post-combustion plant. Uh, adding uh, an amine system would increase the cost of generating electricity at that plant by roughly 70%. <coughs> the incremental costs are lower for uh, gasification combined cycle and natural gas plants, but still quite significant. And uh, in terms of an absolute cost of electricity, uh, we're at different baselines. Uh, we're talking about CO2 capture in this meeting because most of that cost is associated with the capture part of that system. Transport and storage, well, those costs can vary depending on site specific. They're roughly on, on the order of 20%. So if you want to make a <coughs> Uh, a big dent in uh, CCS costs, uh, you've got to go after the capture process. And there are lots of uh, uh, ideas for how to do that. Uh, this is a slide from the Department of Energy showing a, a variety of options that are being pursued in different scales and, and some uh, notion of their time frames for, uh, for, for success. Uh, I was happy and delighted to see GSEP join that uh, process a couple of years ago. Uh, a uh, request for proposals uh, sought advanced carbon capture processes and consist consistent with the GSEP philosophy, uh, looking for, uh, and these uh, were words, step out, game-changing improvements, big improvements uh, that could have big impacts in, uh, in the next uh, uh, several decades. And as a result of that solicitation, uh, three projects were selected. Uh, Ed's project at uh, Notre Dame involving ionic liquids, uh, Randy's project at uh, Northwestern involving metal organic frameworks, and uh, Jen Wilcox's <coughs> project here at Stanford uh, involving uh, some uh, novel activated carbon solvents. Uh, so what am I doing up here? Uh, a year later, uh, there was another RFP asking for uh, development of a systems analysis framework to, to be able to evaluate uh, novel processes, these three in particular, but others in general, uh, in, uh, in the context of some uh, rather rigorous criteria that GSEP had put in the original proposal for what they'd like to see in these advanced uh, processes. Um, so uh, we were selected along with uh, Chris Edwards' group here at, at Stanford to, to work on a uh, systems analysis framework that could be used to, 
get some quantitative uh, metrics for just how these advanced systems would fare relative to uh, baseline systems in, in the context of full uh, power systems. Um, the approach we had uh, uh, proposed and, and have been following is to build on some prior work we've been doing with a lot of support from uh, the Department of Energy. Uh, with that support, we've built a, uh, a modeling framework called uh, IECM is the acronym, if you Google it, Integrated Environmental Control Model. It's essentially a, uh, an easy to use uh, <clears throat> model of a single uh, power plant. It could be coal-fired, gas-fired, uh, biomass. And it basically uh, includes all of the environmental control systems, not only for air, but also for water, because water use is another uh, issue here in solid waste. So it's, it's basically a full-blown mass and energy balance uh, <clears throat> with uh, uh, engineering economic models and the ability to handle uh, uncertainty. We propose to build on this framework uh, as a tool that we and then others could use to uh, uh, ask and quickly answer a whole variety of what-if questions. What if I <clears throat> could create a material that had these characteristics and so on? So the overall approach is uh, basically to uh, couple uh, engineering process performance models with models of uh, uh, cost, engineering economic models, in a, in a systems framework that uh, has a probabilistic capability so one can look at uncertainties in a, in a fairly rigorous way to identify both risks and, and opportunities, uh, and hopefully in a package that, uh, again, is easy to use and, uh, uh, and portable so others can, uh, can play with that. So, the software package, if you were down to download it today, uh, is one that uh, has a graphical user interface behind which there's a lot of stuff. Uh, you bring to the model uh, information on uh, the design of the power plant uh, that you're uh, interested in, fuel properties, some cost factors, and uh, the model delivers information on process performance, emissions, and, uh, and costs. Uh, so uh, when this project started, we had uh, in it already a whole suite of technologies, uh, <clears throat> a number of CO2 capture, baseline CO2 capture systems that we had worked on, some other things we're doing for DOE, and a whole, uh, whole suite of uh, power plant and environmental control technologies. Uh, and what we've been doing in this project is to work specifically with the three groups that GSEP has been funding uh, to develop new process performance and cost models uh, that could be uh, implemented in this framework and used uh, to assess some of the specific criteria that GSEP put in their original proposal. And these guys have, I think, the biggest challenge uh, ahead, of, ahead of them. Uh, GSEP enumerated eight criteria. I've reorganized them to four that basically deal with performance metrics and four more or less with cost metrics. Uh, <clears throat> I've highlighted three of them, the ability to capture and separate more than, more than or equal to 90% of, of, uh, of the CO2 uh, to substantially reduce the energy penalties relative to what they are now, uh, but also to keep the cost low. Uh, so it's a, it's a perfect uh, GSEP challenge and, uh, uh, along with a number of other things. So our job is to try to figure out um, uh, how things are going in these directions and, uh, and pro probably more importantly to try to use a larger modeling framework uh, to suggest ways that uh, one can move more, more effectively toward, uh, toward meeting these goals. So let me tell you first about some of the work we're doing. Um, the three projects all have about a year left, uh, as does our project. So we're, we're about halfway through the project. So this is really a, I intended this to be a, a kind of an informal uh, progress report to uh, 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 GSEP and others. Uh, let me tell you first about what we've been doing in, uh, uh, in the area of post-combustion uh, capture. Uh, I should say, well, I think one of the slides got, mm, I lost the slide here. Uh, I should back up and say first that all three groups that I mentioned are still working actively on their materials. So they have not given us the formula, <coughs> uh, the magic recipes yet for the materials they think will do the best job of that. Uh, somehow, either, Maybe it'll show up later, a slide seems to have been dropped. So what we've been doing is working with uh, what I've called surrogate materials, uh, <clears throat> materials that are similar in nature to the, to the materials that the groups are doing, but they're not, uh, they're not the, the last word. So uh, one of those uh, in, uh, in uh, Jen Wilcox's project here at Stanford 
uh, is looking at, and we heard a little bit about this this morning as well, uh, some novel activated carbon uh, uh, sorbents. Uh, these are basically solid sorbents that uh, might do the job. So on the, uh, <clears throat> on the left, these data points are some data that Jen was kind enough to provide uh, to us. And the solid lines are uh, fits to that data using a uh, conventional Langmuir uh, equilibrium uh, model uh, <clears throat> that uh, does a, a nicer job down in the lower in the temperature ranges that uh, are likely to be, uh, be relevant. So uh, what we have basically is a model representation of, of, of that. Uh, on the uh, uh, MOF uh, <clears throat> side, uh, we have, uh, with advice from uh, <clears throat> the folks at, uh, at Northwestern, we've looked at uh, a number of uh, <clears throat> metal organic frameworks that uh, <clears throat> they believe would be most uh, uh, useful to, uh, to start, uh, start playing with. The data I'll be showing you, so we've looked at a several MOFs. We've also looked at some other solid sorbents, not on uh, uh, either of those types. Uh, so I'll show you some preliminary results in a minute based on uh, this is a, a, a zeolite, uh, we'll just call it ZIF-78, uh, isotherms of the sort that Ed just, sh just showed. Uh, so here is basically uh, CO2 uptake as a function of temperature and pressure. Uh, we'll look at a case study at 50 degrees Celsius, which is a typical flue gas temperature coming in, uh, using isotherms both for CO2 and, uh, and nitrogen, where you'll notice the scale is quite different. Um, <clears throat> We wanted to start uh, as simple as, as we could, uh, and so the first model that we have put together is a, um, a three-step three uh, uh, process which involves adsorption and regeneration. It's a, it's a pressure swing uh, system uh, where uh, flue gas containing, in this case, idealized as, uh, as uh, CO2 and nitrogen uh, is uh, fed into an adsorber. Uh, and then uh, when breakthrough occurs, <clears throat> the system's reversed, and there's a vacuum that pulls out the, uh, the CO2 to, uh, to give a, a CO2-rich uh, rich product. Uh, one of the things you can see in, uh, uh, in, uh, in this system, well, I think I have another slide here. I'm going to skip over the details. It's in there. Uh, here's a better representation. Uh, <clears throat> let's look first at the one on, on the right, on the left, rather. Uh, these two lines, the blue line is showing CO2 recovery, which is basically the CO2 capture efficiency, uh, and the red line showing, <coughs> showing the purity of the CO2 that's captured. Uh, the GCEP target is 90% uh, capture, and uh, for this uh, uh, sorbent at this temperature, uh, the only way to do that is at very low pressures, probably unrealistically low, but those are the numbers that would come out for a single stage vacuum uh, separation. <clears throat> so 90% purity, low pressure, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, 90% recovery, and the, re the, the uh, purity levels are also uh, not, don't exceed about 70%. Uh, these two slides show specific work. This is um, <clears throat> uh, energy per unit mass of CO2 absorbed, and the sorbent required to do that, again, uh, we need to operate at low pressures is what comes out of the uh, uh, information here. So we've run a, uh, a preliminary case study <coughs> using our, uh, our IACM framework uh, where we assume 90% capture in a single stage VSA system. Uh, <coughs> we pressurize the adsorber to a little over atmospheric pressure, 1.2, uh, and desorb at this uh, very low uh, pressure, uh, but then compress the CO2 uh, to 135 bar, which is basically uh, pipeline, uh, pipeline pressures. Um, and here are some pr preliminary uh, results. Uh, let me just focus on this next to the last line, uh, which is the net power plant efficiency. <coughs> uh, basically, uh, there's a lot of energy needed not only to do the capture, but most, this, most importantly, uh, to do the compression uh, if one actually had to go to these very, very uh, low vacuum pressures to, to do that. Uh, so the result in this case is a power plant, which would be 39% efficient without CO2 capture, uh, takes a significant hit comparable to what it would take with a conventional uh, amine system, <coughs> uh, and, uh, <coughs> but also with, with lower uh, purity, 
and uh, that would probably not be uh, uh, pure enough to put into a pipeline. So uh, the take-home message here is we need to go back and, uh, and build a more uh, complex model of uh, of a uh, probably a two-stage process and, maybe, and play with some additional parameters uh, to achieve higher efficiencies and, uh, and higher product purity with, uh, with this system. Uh, this was uh, the best of the several uh, sorbents that we looked at, uh, and so other materials uh, would have similar challenges, I think, is the preliminary finding uh, that we come out of here. Um, we also modeled a pre-combustion system using ionic liquids. Again, we used a particular uh, liquid that was recommended to us by the, uh, the group at, uh, at Notre Dame. Uh, here, basically, we're comparing, a, <coughs> we're substituting an ionic liquid for uh, a conventional Selexol solvent. Uh, the technology, the process for doing that is the same uh, using either, uh, either uh, sorbent. Uh, so there's an absorber. This is syngas from the water gas shift reactor. So it's essentially uh, modeled as a CO2 hydrogen mixture. <clears throat> in this case, in both cases, we've taken impurities out of the system. Uh, <clears throat> and the absorption is followed by a series of uh, depressurization steps <clears throat> uh, in flash drums and recompression to basically desorb the, uh, uh, the CO2. Again, we use uh, data for that particular ionic liquid, which uh, Ed can probably pronounce, and I can't, uh, <coughs> and uh, used it in a uh, preliminary case, uh, case study where, again, we're looking for 90% uh, CO2 capture uh, and uh, taking a, an entire system uh, compressed to 135 bar <coughs> with an idealized gas mixture of CO2 and, and hydrogen. Again, uh, there are details of the process model that I'll put in the, uh, in the presentation, uh, but here's the bottom line uh, in terms of the simulation of the overall power plant. Uh, this is the power just for the, uh, the unit I just showed you, and in this case, the ionic liquid actually uh, it turns out to be about 10% better in terms of energy requirements than, uh, uh, than, uh, than Selexol. Uh, not a huge breakthrough, but a step in the right direction, and we can step, we, we, we can look forward to other properties. Uh, <clears throat> Haibo Zhao, who did this work, also did some sensitivity analyses. We're starting to play around with this to look at uh, effects of, ver of various design parameters. Uh, and what we really need to do, uh, CO2 removal efficiency, if one backed off the 90% target, moved down to, say, 85%, uh, actually some things actually start looking better. So there's a, there's a lot of playing around that remains to be, uh, remains to be done. Uh, I think in terms of preliminary uh, messages that come out of this uh, very early work, uh, we're just underscoring what uh, Ed and others have said, that work on <coughs> novel materials really has to focus on high selectivity uh, to uh, ensure high capture efficiency as well as high purity. Uh, these have all been uh, idealized simple systems, so we haven't mucked it up by putting any water vapor uh, into uh, either of these. <clears throat> All of these materials are, uh, <clears throat> none of these materials like water vapor. And so either you have to design one that is uh, impervious to it uh, or make the system more complex by taking a dehydration step, which is really not what you want to do. So in order to improve the realism of this, uh, we'll need additional data on uh, sorbent behavior in the presence of water and other impurities. And isotherms, not for single component uh, gases, but for, for mixed uh, gases in order to get more, more realistic performance estimates. So none of those uh, imperfections were in those results I showed you earlier. Uh, let me just say a, a, a brief word about process cost models. Um, I'm not going to show you any cost results today. We're working on that, still a work in progress. But just in terms of what our, our approach is and some preliminary conclusions from some other work we finished recently on, on some other processes. Uh, what we try to do in our cost models <coughs> uh, are uh, first estimate on the capital cost side, what are often called direct equip equipment costs. <coughs> what would it cost to uh, uh, buy and install the equipment that one needs to do the capture? What's often forgotten and often handled rather, I was going to say sloppily, that's not right. Um, uh, with not as much care as, as 
uh, as, as is perhaps needed, uh, are a lot of the indirect costs. So in a traditional cost estimate, after you do an equipment costing, <clears throat> there are a series of other measures, things particularly called uh, contingency costs. They're all typically estimated as a percentage <clears throat> of your direct equipment costs. Uh, there are some guidelines for how that can be done. Uh, in some recent work, um, I've stuck my head out and pointed out that uh, major organizations who put out these guidelines, like DOE, EPRI, and, and others, uh, in many of their own studies, don't follow their own guidelines and tend to give numbers that are probably more optimistic than they should be for this stage of development. So we want to be careful in going forward. And the reason is that um, <clears throat> there, there's a lot of history that suggests that um, <clears throat> We tend to be optimistic technologically at the earliest stages of technology development, but as technologies mature toward FOAK is called first of a kind, a real commercial reality. Uh, while ideally we all want to get to that low cost nth of a kind uh, plant, uh, you have to start uh, somewhere else. And you can't get to the nth of a kind plant without building n plants. If you never get past the first one, you'll never get to the nth of a kind plant. Um, so uh, what we have found, and I suspect we'll find in this case, is that high capital costs is another major barrier and hindrance to uh, the entry of new technologies. Uh, historically, there's a lot of data to show that we've done a poor job of predicting uh, uh, costs, commercial costs at early stages of development. Uh, so we're going to try to do a more careful uh, and more realistic job on that. But the message that comes from the work we've done uh, so far is that while uh, as engineers we're also we're, we're always after the holy grail of improved efficiency, um, there are trade-offs. <clears throat> uh, and so there are challenges not only to the technical community uh, in finding and tailoring uh, more appropriate materials, uh, but also to the engineering community at large in finding ways of minimizing the capital cost of, of these systems uh, <clears throat> uh, and, and challenges in terms of how we can make things simpler, how we can reduce the size of vessels, how we can use materials that are cheap and not expensive. Uh, those two uh, sets of challenges, I think, are the ones I will uh, uh, want to emphasize here and the fact that they're inevitably going to be trade-offs uh, between cost and performance in terms of getting to that next best system. So a lot of the work ahead, uh, <clears throat> we have a number of tasks that we had initially proposed that involve refining models, characterizing uncertainties. I haven't talked about life cycle analysis. We want to ask where a lot of these new materials come from and whether there are secondary impacts that need to be of concern. Uh, what we'd like to try to do is try to reverse engineer our models and, and uh, come back with advice to the process developers for what kinds of parameters they ought to be seeking, and that, that will be a major focus of the work that's ahead. So with that, I will thank you, with apologies for running over, and take a question or two if there is one. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. Sally? Thanks. So you said high selectivity is important, but what's high? What, do you have a sense of what's high? What, you know, what would be a target that somebody should be shooting for? Uh, we, we didn't come with, with numbers. If we go back to some of the, <clears throat> some of the data that uh, we showed, it would depend on the particular material that we're, we're talking about. But, but the, the basic message is uh, we need to do a better job of uh, getting higher purities on, the, on, on these separations. So when we see 70% as a maximum for that particular uh, sub, those are basically substances that are reported in the literature. It's not what people are currently working on. Um, what you really want is 90 and, and 90. Uh, so w what that backs into in terms of the particular parameter, we'll figure that out, but that, that's, what we're, that's what we're looking for. Over to Paul. The, the effect of water vapor, I think, is going to be uh, an especially problematic one for, for a lot of these materials, and uh, uh, yes. Um, oh, so on your task list, one thing I didn't see on there, but you did kind of mention it during the talk, is sensitivity analysis, yeah. and I encourage you, yeah, to keep yeah. on on the sensitivity analysis. <laughs> that might help with, maybe you don't build the best plant to begin with, but helps you later on 
when you get to the nth, you can start to do the 90 percent, something like that. Uh, our aspirations are uh, uh, <clears throat> to use the, the probabilistic capability that, that this model has and, and uh, do a more rigorous uh, uh, job with which will involve some expert elicitation. So I'm expecting that we're going to try to visit uh, folks in the three groups to try to uh, elicit their, <clears throat> their best estimates as to what kinds of properties might be achievable. <clears throat> we can put some of those judgments into the models and, and get uh, probabilistic uh, results, <clears throat> the likelihood of achieving different targets, which is, <clears throat> which is a more rigorous way and, and, and would account for a lot of interactions of that. Ideally, we want to do that. Uh, both on the performance and on the cost side, because at the end of the day, as you said, um, you want to get the best system to do a job, and uh, we're going to try to figure out what those parameters are. Great. Thanks very much, Ed. Okay. Thank you.